Hi, good evening. Uh, today we're going to talk about automating your builds with make files. This is intended primarily for people who are doing programming in C or C++, typically on like a, a Linux environment, a command line environment. Um, what I wanted to do was show you how to take a basic C file or C++ file and compile it, and then show you how you can automate that build using something called a make file. So that all you have to do is type in one single command and it will build your entire project from scratch every time you do that. Um, so what I have here on the screen here is just a, a simple little program. Uh, it contains a main down here at the bottom. <clears throat> and what this program does is it just uh, basically computes the distance from the origin to some xy value on the coordinate system. So it prompts you to enter an x and a y value, and then it, it computes the distance using the distance formula and prints it out, some silly little program. But what I've written here is a function called get double. And what get, get double does is it is given a prompt and then a minimum value and a maximum value, and it prints out the prompt, prompts the user to type in a double value, and then makes sure that, that value is within the the specified range, and if it's not, then it goes back and reprompts the user over and over again. So a nice little like utility function that you might want to use in your program. Okay, so let's compile this. So we'll go clang uh, geom.c-o geom. And uh, right now it comes back and it gives us an error, and it says there's an undefined reference to pow and square root. Those are the functions invoked here and here. Those are functions that I didn't supply. They're actually part of the math library. So to get this to compile correctly, I need to run that command again, but add on dash L and M like this, and that tells it to link to the math library. There's actually a file out there called libm dot, some extension, usually it's dot O or dot SO. Uh, what it does is it goes out and it looks for that file, libm dot, SO in this case, shared object, and it uh, links that into your program. Uh, you may be wondering, like, why isn't this sufficient to include the square root and power, power function? That's because the math.h file does not actually contain the code for doing the square root and doing the exponent or the power function. It just contains the function prototypes. And I, I'm going to show you during this live stream about function prototypes and why they go into these files called, dot, called dot .h. But the important thing is that math.h does not contain the actual code for doing square root and power. All it does is includes enough information so that the compiler knows about the existence of the functions, but doesn't actually have the code for it itself. You need to link it in with the math library to get the actual um, code for the square root and the power functions, among, among all the others that are part of the math library. OK, so this compiles the program, and then I can run it. And it says enter the x value, so I could do like 3, y is 4, and I get 5 as the distance, and so we know it's working correctly. Okay, so I want to, uh, before we go much further, I want to talk to you about the, what happens when you actually invoke the C compiler. Ours is called Clang. You may be using GCC. There's a bunch of others, but all the options are pretty much the same. So we start with... A, a source file, like a .c file. And then that goes through what's called the preprocessor. And the purpose of the preprocessor is to handle things like the, the hash include and the hash define directives. And it also strips out comments. Okay, so the preprocessor does two things. It handles all the, the, the directives that start with that, the hashtag in front of them, and it also strips out any comments that are in your programs. And there's a bunch of other things that it does, but those are the two primary things that it does. And then um, what you get out of this preprocessor is a processed C file that has, literally, if I switch back to this screen here, it's taken the contents of these files here, went out on disk, found, that, found those files, and it just copied and pasted them right into your program. Uh, so actually, your program gets huge at this point because 
these two files, standard.io.h and math.h, are fairly big, and they just get copied and pasted right into that right into that spot right there. Okay, so um, I, I don't know what this this is a processed file of some sort, um, but at this point, it now goes through the actual compiler. And the purpose here is to translate C to assembly. Okay, so the compiler actually doesn't produce an executable. The compiler just converts the source file into an assembly file. And so what you get out is a file that ends in dot, dot s. Okay, and there it goes through the assembler. And the purpose here is to translate assembly to what's called an object file. So this object file has nothing to do with objects like in C++ or Java. It's called an object file because it's a compiled file that um, has been targeted for a specific CPU and a specific operating system, but it's not a complete executable. So the, the extensions on these object files are .o, little o. And then from there, it goes through something called the linker. And this brings together object files and produces an executable. Okay, so your C file starts as a raw C file. It goes through the preprocessor, then it goes through the compiler, the assembler, the linker, and then finally you get an executable down when all of this is done. Uh, incidentally, each one of these steps can be invoked with a specific option to the compiler. And again, it doesn't matter whether you use Clang or GCC, it's the same options for both. Uh, to run the preprocessor, it's dash capital E. To run the compiler and stop at the source file, it's da uh, excuse me, at the assembly file, it's dash capital S. And then to run the process all the way through to the object file, it's dash and then a little c. And then the linker is actually invoked as the last step, and there's a way to invoke just the linker, but it's not important at this point what that is. These, these three options here, E, S, and C, are the, the, option, are the important ones for now. Okay, so just to recap here, if you do uh, Clang or GCC dash capital E, it will start with your C file, pre-process it, and then stop. And then if you do Clang or GCC dash S, it'll start with your C file, uh, compile it down to assembly, and then stop. And then if you do the same thing with dash C, it starts with a C file, goes all the way down to the object file, and stops. And then if you just invoke it with no options whatsoever, it goes all the way through the whole process. Okay, so let's switch back over here. Oh, let me, let's do this. Let's go new screen. So what I've got here is I have a file called geom.c, right? And uh, what I could actually do, let's see. Oh, well, well, yeah. And what I'm doing right now is I'm just running clang geom.c-o geom, and then I get a, an output called geom, right? So that's this one, one command that takes the C file, brings it through all the processes, all the steps, and then outputs an executable. Okay, but now what I'm thinking is with my program here, this get double function, you know, might be kind of handy to to use in other programs. Like, you know, this is actually a fairly handy little utility program. So I happen to have another one here called 
tip. And for those of you in the United States, it's fairly common at the end of a meal in a restaurant to get your bill at the end and then you see the amount and then you leave what's called a tip for the waiter, the wait staff, and then uh, that's the total amount that you pay. And so you decide what the, the amount of tip that you wanna pay is, typically it's about 10 or 15%, maybe a little bit more, but um, usually that, you add that on to the bill. So that's what this program does, is you enter the price of a meal, you enter the tip amount, it calculates the amount of your tip, calculates the total amount, and then prints it out. Okay, so let's try it out. So enter the price of the meal, let's say it's $20, and I want to leave a 15% tip. So it says that I should leave a $3 tip, and the total amount is $23. Okay, um, but like I said, this, this get double would be a handy uh, function to run here because you know, I want to be able to make sure that they type in a, say, a positive number for the price of the meal, and the tip amount should also be a positive number, and it should be between like zero and, and 100, 100%, whereas the price of a meal could be zero to just about anything. So, to be able to use get double here, of course, the kind of naive way to do it is, let's take that and we'll copy it, we'll paste it over here. So there it is. And then here I can say price equals get double. And the, the, the meal should be between zero and let's say $1,000. And then for the tip, that should be between zero and 100%. Okay, so let's save it, recompile it, there we go, and then we'll run it. So let's say $20, and then for the tip amount, we you know, accidentally put in 150, so it says tip amount must be at most 100. We can put in a negative number, and it says it has to be at least zero, so we can put in 15, and then you know, it's, it's working here. Okay, so the point of this was, <coughs> I have this function called get double, and in order to use it in two different programs, I had to copy and paste it into both the files. And of course, you're thinking, there's got to be a better way to do this. What I want to be able to do is take get double out of this file and put it into its own file, and then have, have both of those programs refer directly to it. So that's what we're going to do, is I'm going to copy this, and then I'm going to create a new file paste it in, and then we'll save this, and we'll call this something like gd.c, getdouble.c. Get and then, in my geometry program, I can get rid of it. Right? I don't need it because it's in another program, another file. Same thing in tip. I can get rid of it there. Okay, so save save and save and now what I want to do is compile all three of these files separately so that uh, I can then link them all together at the very end. If you remember that picture we had we're going to compile them. What we're going to do is we're going to compile them and we're going to go as far down that that uh, diagram as getting to the object files. So we'll have an object file for each of the three Geometry. Okay, so let's let's try this out. So down here, I'm going to go g uh, clang dash c because I only want to go as far as creating an object file, gd.c. And this one gives me some warnings. It says I don't know what printf and scanf are, and that's because in my gd.c file I need to include standardio.h so that gd.c knows about these functions. So I've saved it, let's try it again. Okay, wait, hey, that compiled. And it looks like in the directory, I now have a file called gd.o. That contains the compiled version of gd.c. It's not a complete executable, I can't run it, but it's, it's the compiled version of gd.c. 
And now let's try to do the same thing for geometry.c. And it says, can't do that. Or at least it gives you a warning. It says, you're trying to use a function called get double, and I don't know what get double is. So the, the solution here, well, one thing we could do is we could say include gd.c like this. And you remember what I said about how the preprocessor goes out and it finds that file and it copies and pastes the contents of the file right into your program. So it will go out and find gd.c in the current directory. That's what the double quotes mean. The double quotes means look in the current directory for gd.c. And when it finds it, it'll open it up and copy and paste the contents right at that spot. So it's just like we wrote the get double function right there in the program. But you'll find that if we do this, then it, it compiles just fine. Actually, we can make a complete executable out of it. Uh, and link to the math library. Okay. So it works just fine, three, four, distance is five. Okay, but what, what we haven't done is we haven't really compiled the two files separately. What we did was we took geom.c and then copied and pasted gd.c right into it and then compiled that one file. <clears throat> um, so imagine if we had a really, really large project here um, where it might be thousands of C files, perhaps a million or so lines of code. What we don't want to be doing is taking all of our C files and copying and pasting them into one giant file because that would mean we'd have to compile a one million uh, the, the result of the copy and paste would be a one million line file that we would have to compile all at once. What we want to do is compile each one of the files separately so that if we change one of the files, we can just recompile that one small one and then link them all back together again. Okay, this is a, a lot, lot faster than compiling a million lines uh, all at once. So just change one little file, recompile it, uh, link it all together, and then you've got a new executable. So what I really want to be able to do is compile geom.c separately, totally independently from gd.c, rather than including them. Um, but you saw how if we take out this include, it doesn't, doesn't work so well. So that's because geom.c needs to know about the existence of get double. It doesn't need the code for it. It just needs the, ex needs the existence, which means all it really needs is a function prototype for it. Character pointer uh, prompt double min and double max. Okay, there's the function prototype for get double. And if we save that, we can see that we can compile geom.c as an to an object file. So now I have uh, where is it? Let's try that again. Oh yeah, here it is, geom.o, right there. I didn't see that at first. But there's the object file. Here's gd.o, there's its object file. And then we can just, we can just compile the, link the two of them together. So if we say clang geom.o and gd.o and output that as geometry, geom, uh, along with linking to the math library, then we get a complete executable. And then we can run it. Three, four, outputs of five. Okay, so let's switch back to this picture here. And let's start a new diagram. So I have geom.c and gd.c. And I want to Compile this with clang dash c geom dot c and the output of that will be geom dot o and then with gd dot c I'll compile that one with clang dash c gd dot c 
and the output of that is gd.o and then I will link them together with clang geom.o gd.o and then output it to geom and then don't forget to link in the math library. So there's the one the one big command that I use there and then the output of that is the executable. So it's three commands to compile this program <clears throat> But those are all the steps separately done, and, and it, it seems like it's complicated now, but it's actually going to save time later on. Okay, now let's think about what we want to do with our other file, which was tip.c. Right? So I wanted to compile that and make tip.o and I would use a command that's very similar to this one but it would just be uh, tip.c right here and then I would link gd.o and tip.o directly together to make my tip program and the command I would use there is clang tip.o gd.o-o tip, and this one doesn't need the math library, it doesn't need the sines and cosines, so I don't have to link in the math library, but that's the command I would use to bring those together. Now here's where the payoff is, is that I only had to compile gd.o once, and then I'm able to use it in two different programs over here. Okay, so let's try that out on this screen. Let's go back to my tip program here, and I'll include the function prototype double get double character pointer prompt double min double max I'll save it so I can compile tip.c and then let's link it all together tip.o gd.o dash o tip and it compiles and then I can run it $20, 15% tip, $23 total. Okay, so, so what I did there was, just to recap, compile geom.c into geom.o, same thing with gd.c and tip.c, and then I linked both of those together to make this executable, and then I linked gd.o and tip.o together to make this executable. <clears throat> okay, so if you had to do this, that, well, um, let's see, where do I want to go? Well, there's two things I want to do. So I want to actually kind of go back to this program here, and, and the last thing I want to show you is that it's, it's kind of a pain here to have to um, type in the function prototype for get double twice. What I want to be able to do is have both the programs be able to know what the function prototype for get double is. And you do that by making what's called a header file. This is exactly what I typed in before, but I've just put it into its own file. So I'm going to save this as gd.h. So h files are just C or C++ files. They're, they're actually no different. The extension is the only thing that's different on them. The implication of making it an h file, a header file, is that it doesn't contain any actual C code. It only contains things like function prototypes, global variable definitions, defines, includes, and things like that, but no actual code itself. And then in tip.c, I can just say include gd.h, and in geom.c, I can do the same thing. And then let's just verify that it all compiles. Okay, there's tip.c. And there's geom.c, they compile just fine. And then I can 
bring tip.o and gd.o together to make the tip program. Do the same thing for the geometry program. And then that one compiles together. All right, so, so now you understand, hopefully, why math.h and standardio.h don't include the actual code for printf, scanf, square root, sine, cosine. They only contain things like function prototypes. And the actual code needs to be somewhere else, in some other file that gets linked to it at the very end. <clears throat> when we compile, when we link with the dash lm module, uh, lm option, it's saying go out and find a, a pre-compiled object file. They're already, they're out there on the, on the computer's disk and then link them together at the very end. So instead of having to supply the name of the .o file, you just say dash lm and it goes out and it finds the file and it links it in for you. Okay, so, so that's the general process here. So what we're going to do now is show you how to automate this picture, this picture here in something called a make file so that it will do all those commands for us automatically. Okay, so that's the next thing we're going to do. So let's create a new file. <clears throat> and this file should be called makefile. And actually by convention, it's given a capital M, but it doesn't matter really. But the convention is it's given a capital M with its name. Oops, uh, I just overwrote some other make file. Let's try that again. There we go. So the first line of your make file should be this. And this is, this is actually a comment. It starts with a, a hash mark character. That's, that indicates that it's a comment. But what this comment does is it tells this editor to format this file as a make file. In particular, the formatting for a make file is very specific. The, it's, it's broken up into a bunch of chunks, and each one of these chunks is called a recipe. And the recipes have uh, the format target, colon, dependencies. And then on the next line, there's a tab, and then an action that you take. And this is the important part here, is this right here has to be a tab. In other words, you're going to hit the tab key on your keyboard, and most of the time what the editor is going to do is instead of actually inserting one single ASCII tab character, which I think is a control I, it's going to put in four spaces. And that's actually not allowed in a makefile. It has to be one single tab character. So putting in this comment at the top tells the editor, um, disable the the action did disable the, the default of putting in four spaces and actually allow me to put in a single tab. Okay, so this diagram that we have is called a dependency tree. Okay, it says that in order to build this executable, it depends upon geom.o and gd.o existing. And in order to build geom.o, it depends upon geom.c. In order to build gd.o, it depends on gd.c. Same thing for tip.o and tip.c. So there's a dependency here that geom depends on these two, and then geom.o depends upon this one, and gd.o depends on this one. So we're going to embed this entire diagram in that make file. So this is the format of it. Yeah, actually, I want to turn these into comments so they don't get acted on. Okay, so the first target is going to be geom. And it depends upon geom.o and gd.o. And then for the action, we're going to put down what command you would type in on the command line to build geom from these two files. And from our diagram, it's... It's this command. So we're going to put that in. Clang geom.o gd.o dash o geom dash lm. 
Okay, and then we've got to write two more recipes because there's a dependency here. So geom.o depends upon geom.c, and the command to build geom.o from geom.c is clang -c, -c, c And then one last recipe, gd.o depends upon gd.c, and the command to build it is clang -c, -gd c So let's save that. <coughs> And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove all the files that I don't need. So remove the O files and geom and tip. Okay, so that leaves just the, the C files and the H files. And if I just type make, it runs all three commands that are needed to build the geom file automatically. Just it did them all. So it, it basically did this command, this command, and this command. And what it did was it started at the top and it said, okay, I need to build geom. I need to build it out of these two files, but I don't see those here. So I need to build it, I need to build this file out of this one. Oh, I do see this one here, so I'm gonna run this command to build this file. And then it comes back down this branch of the tree and it goes, oh, I don't see gd.o dot here, but I do see gd.c, so I'm gonna run this command and then to build this file, and now that I have both of these files, I can run this command to build this one. Okay, so it walks down the tree and then walks back up the tree to build things. And we can see that in the order of the commands that it ran. It did geom.c first, so it went down the left side of the tree. Then it did gd.c, so it went down the middle of the tree. And then once it had both of those uh, object files, it can then run the command at the top of the tree. Okay, let's do the same thing now for the, the other side, the tip side. So we'll go tip is built out of tip.o and gd.o and the command to uh, run that, uh, to build that is clang tip.o, geom.o, uh, sorry, gd.o and output to tip. Okay, and then I need one more uh, recipe in here, and that's to build tip.o out of tip.c. And then we'll save it, and if I type make, it's actually going to say geom is up to date. In other words, it didn't build tip, and the reason for that is the make file or the make program starts at the top of this file, and it just executes the instructions for the first recipe that it finds. So it found this one, it built this, this target, and then it stopped. So I need to, so in order to make it build this one, I just come to the command line and I say make tip, the name of the, the uh, target that I want, and it goes down and jumps to that target and then uh, builds that target from those dependencies. Okay, so, so to build geom, I just type make, and it does that because that's the first one, and to build tip, I just, uh, I say make tip and it builds that one. Okay, and then let's go and let's remove everything again. So we'll go remove star.o, tip and geom. Okay, and then what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna, this is a, actually what's typically done is if you wanna build multiple targets in this case, you have to add another rule, another recipe. That's and usually that recipe is called all, and you just list out after after the after the word all uh, each of the targets that you want to build by default. So that's all you got to do there, and there's no action you write for that, no action at all. So what it does is it it starts at the top, it finds this target, and it says, oh, I need to build this one and and this one. And then it goes and it builds this one, and it builds this one, and then you're done. So we'll save that, and now I can just type make, or I can type make all, same thing, just type make. And it very quickly goes and it builds everything. That's really cool. So now I could do something like, let's say I go into here and I, and I change something here, like let's change this to miles. Okay, I know the units don't matter, but I just made one little change. 
I saved it, and now I'm just going to type make. And notice that it only recompiles the one file that changed and then relinks everything together. Okay, that's this is the the real awesome thing about make files is it only it, it actually looks in the dependency tree. So it looks down this tree and it goes, okay, I need to build geom. Um, I see geom.o here, but it is older than geom.c, so I'm gonna recompile it. And then gd.o, but that's newer than gd.c, so I don't need to recompile that. So it doesn't rebuild this, but then since this dependency changed, it, it reruns this command and builds this one. And then it walks down this tree and it goes, didn't change, didn't change, nothing to do. And then it, it stops there. All right, so we've, we've embodied the entire dependency tree in this thing called a make file, and we wrote very simple rules. Um, we put in a target, we put in what it depends upon, and then we put in a rule to uh, describe how to build that. Now, actually, our, our make file isn't quite complete because there's one file that's in our project that isn't listed in this make file, and that's this one, this gd.h. Okay, so what we actually need to do is say um, geom.o depends not only on geom.c but also on gd.h. Because if we were to ever change this header file, like add on a new, a new function to it, or if we were to, let's say, change the function prototype, change the name of the function, or change one of the types, then we would want to recompile the, the geometry file. And the same thing for tip. Okay, if that header file ever changes, we want to recompile. And probably the same thing for gd.o, although it's not listed explicitly in the, the header file. Basically, what you do is you go through your, your C file and you look for anything that's included. So anything that's, anything that's needed to build this particular file, you need to include in the, the make file. Now, we don't have to include standard io.h because that, like, for all intents and purposes, never changes. So you don't have to worry about that. But gd.h might, might change. So we need to list that here in our make file. And uh, what that means is that our, our picture actually changes a little bit here. We have a new thing called gd.h right here. Um, and there's a dependency here on that to go to that one and there's a dependency to go to that one there. Okay, so, so if this file ever changes, we want to make sure we recompile this one to build this one, and if this file ever changes, we'll rebuild this one. In fact, well, let's, let's demonstrate that. So let's go into gd.h and let's, do some, let's make a change to it, but let's, like, we, we can even just add a comment. Okay, that's enough to make this file change. And then we'll go down here, we go make, and, oh, I didn't save my make file. There we go, make, and then it rebuilds the whole thing. Okay, but notice that uh, gd.c is not included here because it didn't change. The only thing that changed was gd.h. All right, so, so that's the basic idea behind make files is it embodies a dependency tree, and the function for it, uh, the, the format for it is really simple. It's a target, dependencies, and then an action to take. And usually the action is to build, uh, build the target out of these dependencies, and then you, you put in the whole thing. And there's tons of shortcuts that you can put into this. And you can actually, honestly, you can, you can write one rule that does the whole thing, basically, that says, um, you can write one rule that basically does pattern matching. This is anytime you see a .c file, run this command on it. Um, but I, I won't get that into that here. You can look those up. The last thing I want to do is I want to put in one, a couple of additional rules. Uh, here's a new. One. Here's one that's usually put in. It's called clean. This one doesn't have any dependencies. It's just a target, but it does have an action. So the purpose of this one is to clean up your project directory, so you leave just the source files. It removes the object files and removes the executables. Okay, I'll save that, and if I say make clean, then it cleans up my directory, and then I can say make, 
and then it rebuilds the whole thing. So if you ever want to just kind of start over again, if you want to clean up your entire project and, and rebuild it from scratch, you go make clean and then make, and then it's, it's two commands to do it all. Okay, but you don't really have to do make clean every single time. You know, I, I've seen people kind of get in the habit of always doing a make clean and then a make. Every, in other words, they, they change one file and then they do a make clean and then they do a make. And for small projects, not a big deal. If this was a big project with a couple hundred or a thousand files in it, you really don't want to be doing a make clean every time you change one little file. Okay, so you can put uh, recipes in the make file that have a target but no dependencies. And you can put in recipes that have a target and only dependencies, or you can mix and match. Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to do is show you what happens if you put in a rule here, but instead of typing a tab, you put spaces in. Okay, I'll save that. I'll go make clean. And you get this error message that says missing separator. And that error message should, it doesn't really describe what's going on, but it should just tell you that it encountered a space here and instead of a tab. Okay, so I, I just deleted those spaces and I hit tab. And then if I do make clean now, then it works. Um, oh, last thing, you know, probably better to put a dash F here. That way, if, see if I do a make clean. Oh, see, if I take off the dash F, I'll show you what happens. Make clean. Then you get this error message that says, can't remove dot O, can't remove tip and geometry. So you just get error messages out of that. And so I put on the dash F to say, force the removal, um, but don't complain if they don't exist. All right, so that's a little bit better. And um, I'll tell you a personal story here. It's it's, it's nice to have make files where you've typed in this command and you've vetted it and you make sure it works. Um, there was one time I was working on a project. And this was late at night. I was pulling an all-nighter. And in my, in my 3 a.m. stupor of not being able to think straight, I wanted to delete all the files in my project, or at least clean it up, so I could re recompile it from scratch. And I didn't know about make files at this time. So I typed this accidentally put a space between the star and the dot O. And then what happens is the remove command um, silently removes everything and then says can't find a file called dot O. And that's when I started to sweat profusely because I realized what happened here is that it just deleted all of my files. And so from that point forward in my career, I've always made sure that whenever I remove things with the wild card there, I look at it like two or three times and make sure I didn't accidentally put a space in there. Or I make a make file and put that command in there and I make sure that it works. And then I, I never type the remove command myself. I just type make clean and I know that it's going to work. So another purpose of make files is to eliminate errors like that. All right, so that's pretty much what I had for you as far as make files. Um, I see there's a couple of people watching on, on, uh, on the live stream. That's great. If you've got any questions, now would be the time to post it. Otherwise, um, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll call it good for now. And I'll see you guys um, next time. All right. Bye-bye.